Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this day in which we study the proper 16, Matthew chapter 16, uh, the, the confession of Peter, one of the great moments in the gospel. You know, you always look at the gospels and you see that there are these climactic moments. And this is one of them because it comes at the end of the Galilean ministry, just before Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem. We certainly saw a climactic moment a few weeks ago in the feeding of the 5,000. That is, the, in many ways, the miracle of miracles, because it occurs in all four Gospels. But this is the first time in the Gospels a human being confesses Jesus to be the Christ. It's always been amazing to me that it took so long. It's been two plus years that he's been in Galilee and that it took that long for somebody to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. I think it is in connection with the feeding of the 5,000. I think Peter sees that feeding of the 5,000. This is very clear in Luke because they're juxtaposed together. But Peter sees that feeding of the 5,000 and he says, my goodness, this is the new Moses. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. Now clearly, as we turn to the text, and it's here in green, you can see that, that this is the, the highlight, that he is the Christ, and then he is the Son of the living God. You know the Gospels all have this confession a little different. And this is, I think, a very important one for Matthew. Um, you've got these two nominatives. They are, they are in apposition to one another. You are the Christ, that is, you are the Son of the living God. Two weeks ago, we saw the disciples after the great miracle of Jesus walking on the water saying that truly this one must be the Son of God. Here, again, the Son of the living God. And the connection here between Christ and Son of God is so important. We do have another title here, one that Jesus uses of himself. It certainly is a title of Jesus in his humility. I always speak of it as being the one that is used in connection with Jesus' passion. So it's always a connection of Jesus' suffering. That is that Jesus is the Son of Man. And it, it's the question that prompts all of this. Who do men, the men, say me, the Son of Man, to be? Who do they say the Son of Man to be? Luke doesn't have Son of Man. He doesn't have that. This is, this is Matthew here describing himself with this title. And you can see that one of the ways to preach on this is to talk about these three titles, Son of Man, Christ, and then Son of the Living God. And in a way, you have the whole person of Jesus Christ there, Son of Man, Son of God. There's your sermon right there. It's really a, a wonderful way to look at it. But let's back up a little bit here, get into this text. Um, <clears throat> I had the privilege of staying <coughs> in Israel one year on an archaeological dig in Caesarea, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, in Philippi. And here, uh, the... Uh, it, this is, is what identifies it for us. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was thinking, I was looking at, at Mark's gospel, and the reason of Caesarea Philippi. Yeah, there it is, Caesarea Philippi. I'm sorry, I I'm, I'm, had a moment there. Caesarea Philippi, okay, which is today called Banias. And it's up in the northern part of Israel. So if you're looking at Israel here, here's Jerusalem. Here's the Sea of Galilee coming down the Jordan and up here. And Mount Hermon is up here, and Caesarea Philippi is way up in here. There's a Caesarea Maritima here. So there are two Caesareas. And we did a dig here, you know. Herod, uh, Herod Agrippa II, this was his palace here. And th this is a beautiful, lush area because it's coming out of the mountains. There's a lot of water flowing down the Jordan here. It's really quite beautiful up there. And, and I think, you know, th this is also up in here, Mount Hermon. Of course, feeding of the 5,000 is down by the Sea of Galilee. And I think the Transfiguration is up here because 
Caesarea Philippi is so close to that. Anyway, I think it's important to recognize that this is a place where the god of Pan is worshipped by the pagans, the Romans. Banias, Pan, it's a variation of that. And you can see here the contrast between the pagan confession that is going on in Caesarea Philippi and the confession of Peter and Jesus' own self-confession of himself as the Son of Man. I put in blue here what the oral tradition is on Jesus. And the oral tradition puts Jesus in a prophetic category. And this is, and I think we need to understand this, this is a positive category. This is a category that you cannot, you know, um, look at in any other way as being positive. And, and, and Jesus is now going to fit in this continuity of which John the Baptist is the climax of the old. You know, here Elias, he's one of the, the great two. If, if you think back to the feeding of the 5,000 being the Moses moment, here you have Elias. And then Jeremiah, this is added by Matthew. Luke does not have that. But Jeremiah being one of the suffering prophets, so you can see the context of suffering here. Certainly, uh, John the Baptist fits that ca category, and to a certain extent, Elias. And then one of the prophets. It's, it's definitely these prophet, 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 prophet. It's a prophetic category. And what, what, you, what you have here then, and I think this is important, is you, you're having this continuity of the prophets of the old, you know, culminating in the old of John the Baptist, and now you have Jesus, who is the final eschatological prophet, precisely because he is the Christ, and that means that he is son of man and son of God. Now this continuity is the prophetic pattern. I mean, you can call it typology if you want, but it's, it's the... The fact that the prophets bear in themselves a foretaste of Jesus. And Jesus does finally put it to the, to, the, to, the, um, to the disciples, you know, who do you say me to be? Who do you say that I am? You know, the great confession is, is what prompted by Jesus in his own statement. You know, who do you, who do you say to be? To be? And I want to start here by just looking at the various names for Simon. Here, it's Simon Peter, so you've got the two names. Here, it's Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. And then it's just Peter. We've come down to Peter, who is the rock. There's his, his new name. Now, there are a couple of things going on here. Uh, obviously, this is the highlight, the nota bene, note well. The, you know, this is the note well, the confession. But it is hard to not see that flowing out of this confession, and this is in Matthew, is the office of the keys, you know, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the binding and the loosing. Here's the great statement on forgiveness. And that in a way it centers in on Peter, who is able to say this. And blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father. I put father in there because it's another title here. It's obviously not the title for the son, but it's, you know, when you see the son, you see the father. The father in heavens has revealed it. So the the Father is behind this plan that Jesus be manifested now through the confession of Peter as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, and, that, and that Peter is the rock upon which this church is going to be formed. Now you know there's the big debate, is it Peter or is it confess his confession? And as with many things, the answer is yes. It's not just one of them. It's not, you know, it's not simply Peter, the person of Peter, and it's not simply his confession. It's that Peter, a human being, first among the twelve, 
um, is the, the one of the you know the foundations of the church. Uh, Peter is a very important person in his person, and and he is a leader in the church. He is somebody, you know, who you cannot ignore as being a significant, if not the most significant, of the apostles. And it is what is given to him, the keys of the kingdom, and it's given not just to him, but to the twelve, and. Really, again, going back to the pattern, it's part of the whole pattern. So the Old Testament pattern had these keys, you know, now Peter and the Twelve have them, and it continues with pastors today. So there's a, a great continuity there that I think you have to see. And I, I, I would spend some time in my sermon talking about Peter. I'd go back into the Gospel and see where he, he shows up. And of course, Peter is part of the three. The other two are the sons of Zebedee, James and John. You know. And these three occur at two places, at least in Luke, at the Transfiguration and at the preparation of the table for the Last Supper. There may be other places I'm not sure of, but I mean, I think certainly you have those two. Those are the two that I remember right now. Um, but anyway, I, th I think you have a remarkable moment here where you can see that, that, that Peter does rise up among everyone else and, and he, he is highlighted by Jesus. Blessed are you, Peter. You know, in many ways, Peter is like Mary in the sense that Mary fulfills a role that no one else can fulfill, that she has been chosen. And that role is to be the mother of God. Peter is, is fulfilling a role here because he is chosen. To be, in a sense, the, the, the first among equals, the one to whom the keys of the kingdom are given. And, and as I said, that extends beyond Peter, but he's the first to be given that. I think if you're going to, to preach on this honestly, you have to connect the confession that Jesus is the Christ with the forgiveness of sins. Um, forgiveness, of course, is the great Lutheran theme. It happens to be a great theme of the life of Jesus. And the capacity to have the keys of the kingdom, to, for, to bind and to, and to loose, is in the heart of the office which is given to Peter, and that is then the office that we inherit from this, this, this command by Christ, that this is at the heart of what it is that we are pastors. And we just finished a bunch of miracles. And, and I want to suggest to you that one of the things about forgiveness and why it occurs here the way it does, and this idea of unlocking the kingdom of heavens, is that it, it frees. It's liberating, like miracles do. Like, like the miracles that we've been looking at, how they free creation from its bondage. And, of course, the entire creation is infected with the, 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 the virus of sin, and that what Jesus comes to do as the Christ, the Son of the living God, is to liberate us, to set us free from that sin. Um, this passage closes, and I think we sometimes forget this, and it's, I think, an important conclusion of what Jesus does here with the disciples at the very end of this passage. And, and after this great confession, he warns them in order that they speak to nothing, to no one, that he is the Christ. Now, this is that kind of that messianic secret. But I, I noticed Christ is referred to again. It sticks out there. I put it in, in, in that green so you can just see how, how it jumps out. But this is not going to be understood until the cross. And nobody is going to understand that this forgiveness here is ultimately related to this liberation. And that the Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God, in his atonement. It is only through blood. And that blood is what we need to preach on more than anything else. And that blood is what cleanses the creation and makes it new. That blood is what restores the creation and makes it whole. And so as we 
as we make our way now, you know, through the rest of this summer and, and, and see this climactic moment where you finally have somebody confessing Jesus to be who he truly is, we see that his identity is most clearly revealed as the Christ when he is crucified. And they, they really can't say that to anyone because they're not going to understand all of that until after he rises from the dead, in a way, until Pentecost. And so the, the confession that we make today is only because we know the end of the story. We know what happens at Calvary. We know what happens on the third day. We know what happens 50 days later at Pentecost. And we participate in that reality of Christ's presence as Son of Man and Son of God every time we gather together and eat the very body and blood of Christ who has come as the Christ, the Son of the living God.